Welcome everybody. Hi, my name is Jeannie Rosner. Um, I know many of you and I think some that I did not know. I introduced myself to you all and welcome. Everyone is welcome. My daughter is here today, Jamie. She's probably the youngest salon um, attendee in history. Um, we host events once a month. Uh, we've been doing them here mostly. Uh, uh, we smatter in a couple virtual events every once in a while. So if you want to be on our master email list, just go to my website, soulfoodsalon.com. At the very top, there's like a little sign up here, like a little email, little uh, icon. You can click on it and put your information in. Again, everyone is welcome. Um, I'm on social media, mainly Instagram. It's Soul Food Salon. I would love it if you'd follow. I post, I've been trying not to post as much actually lately. I'm, it's one of my New Year's resolutions just to kind of be off social media a bit, but I post recipes and if I post a recipe, it's, it's really good and easy. I only make easy, yes. And I love chocolate. She can verify that as well. So I, I don't skimp on that. Um, so yeah, follow along, Soul Food Salon. Um, each year I partner with a different nonprofit. This year I'm partnered with One Tree Planted. And um, basically they are help, they're an international organization um, and we are focusing our effort in California to reforest California. So it's super easy to make a donation. My website, soulfoodsalon.com, you go to the middle of it, little uh, blurb about who I'm partnered with, and then there's donate here, you can click on it. So actually $1 plants one tree. So you can, at the minimum, you can even just donate a dollar. Um, but maybe you can think about, you know, I don't charge to come to these events. Maybe you could think, oh, I would come and hear the, these beautiful speakers today for $25. So maybe consider planting 25 trees. I would really appreciate it. I think we've, we've raised, I haven't looked recently, but probably a little more than $3,000 so far. I was hoping for more, so please help me out there. Um, so today I have the pleasure to introduce two amazing speakers, one who you all are not ready for yet, you don't know about yet, so I, let, me, let, me, let me share this with you. So today's topic is uh, New Year's resolutions for your cognitive health. And our main speaker is Ed Park. He has a PhD in chemical and biomolecular engineering. He is an unbelievable wealth of knowledge. Um, he is the founder of NeuroReserve, which is um, a preventive health and nutrition company focusing on healthy brain aging. And Ed and I became acquainted with each other through Annie Fenn, who many of you all probably know. She's hosted numerous events. Annie is one of their medical advisors um, on their board. And, um, so Ed has written quite a bit for me in the past on our, in our Soulful Insights. And um, so yeah, he's here to present. He's just a wealth of knowledge. He's gonna make our brain healthier just to hear him talk. <laughs> so Ed's gonna do the majority of the conversation. And then we have Ellie Kaplan, who is a local uh, person. She lives in Redwood City. She is the co-founder of NeuroTrack, um, which is a digital, they, they've created a digital cognitive screening tool that's used mainly in primary care offices, it's, and she's gonna go into detail on it. It's really important, and I, I, I don't wanna take the wind out of your sail, but I don't know if any of you've had issues with maybe parents that are aging and when you do the cognitive testing for them. I personally had that with my mom, and you know she was farther along, and by then she had like a two hour test in front of a computer, which is super scary for her. And this is something that's like a three minute thing that they give you a tablet when you walk into your primary care office. So it's like a very, it's an early prevention perhaps. All right, so Ed's gonna start, then Ellie's gonna chime in a bit at the end and then we'll have time for Q and A. Okay. Oh, thank you. Hey everybody. All right, so, so, when, so when Jeannie was talking about um, planting trees and, I was just thinking to myself, Ed, you better do a good job here, or else you're going to be the guy on the side of the road planting all your tree on behalf of you, just planting all these trees. Um, but, uh, but Jeannie, thanks so much for having me here. Uh, Jeannie's put together just an amazing, an amazing program with Soul Food Salon. I, I, just the, the, the level of speakers that have come in are just, just amazing, and particularly in brain health. I, you know, Roberta Diaz Brinton came. She's a luminary in women's brain health. Uh, so. I'll, I'll try to kind of keep up with that today and, uh, and, and you know, drop some, uh, some information about brain health and nutrition for you. So just to start out, um, thanks for coming. And there might be different reasons you're here. Okay. And uh, you know, how many of you have had family members affected by a neurodegenerative disease? You know, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, other types of related dementias, right? 
So, uh, so that's becoming more and more common, and we'll discuss that a little bit. Um, you like longevity in general. You know, so you might have a little bit in there about longevity in general, so and how to, how to live that extra maybe 10 years longer. You know, that, that, that's, you know that's, a, that's a great goal to put in front of ourselves, you know. Um, and of course, see, there was some, this was supposed to be a PowerPoint presentation where I'm supposed to animate stuff, and boom, all of a sudden, everybody was, everybody was supposed to go, yes, we're all huge fans of Genie, of course. <laughs> So, so, yay! All right. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. I'll sit down now. So. Um, but, okay, so what we'll cover is, is five things here. Um, what is brain aging? So why is it unique? Uh, blue zones and Mediterranean diets and how they were involved in brain health. Nut nutrients that are rich in the Mediterranean diet that are related or relevant to brain health. You might have heard a lot about Alzheimer's drugs. Um, that have been coming out, um, especially last year, and also coming this year. So we'll discuss that also, and, and what the role they're going to be playing. Right? And finally, what's the future? And then we're going to have an, uh, an exciting presentation from Ellie as well, that just kind of, boom, tacks right onto that. So um, it goes into the future, actually, as well. So first, let's define brain aging, at least at the daily level, or, you know. So really, it's Brain aging, it happens, first of all, right? Just like any other part of our bodies. Um, our heart, you know, our, our, well, what we can feel, like our joints, you know, our muscles, you know. Um, like every other part of our body, our brains age. And, you know, they, they can age faster, they can age slower, and it's gonna show itself or manifest in a spectrum. And, you know, what I'm showing here is just kind of some very daily examples of the spectrum of cognitive aging. You know, at the left-hand side here is like, oh, here's some what we would call, I guess, normal aging, we would call that, right? You know, maybe forgetting a name or a place, you know, walking into a room, why did I come in here? Okay, yes, now I remember, right? Um, and other things, you know, like sometimes, oh, what, oh, it's Wednesday today? No, oh no, it's Thursday, right? You know, what day of the week it is. Then on the other side of the spectrum becomes more abnormal aging, and that becomes more impairment and starts to interfere with our you know, daily life, right? And, uh, and the way you kind of start to figure that out is you, you look at things that people you do on a daily basis or, or loved ones do on a daily basis and realize that maybe their ability to execute them is, is impaired, you know, like a recipe, you know, that they've made over and over and over again. The classic situation, of course, is during the holidays. That's when a lot of different um, cognitive impairment is detected within families because the family gets together again. They're putting together a recipe that's been made over and over again year over year, and all of a sudden, the pers one person may not be able to remember how to do it or to sequence it out, right? They just forget. Um, there are things like getting lost in a familiar place that car ride that you take to, you know, maybe the drive to the gym in the morning or drive to a, you know, school or wherever they go, right? And they've done it hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times, but then all of a sudden, one day, they cannot figure out how to get there. You know, that's a little bit more of a sign, right, of abnormal aging. So, and of course, you know, being able to follow a conversation. Um, conversations actually are cognitively very high-level tasks, right? Um, you're, taking in information, you're remembering what the person said, now you have to form thoughts and you know, react, basically, or respond to what they're saying, and you're doing this in rapid succession, right? So being able to follow and join a conversation is, is one of those um, uh, complex tasks that, uh, that people with abnormal aging or impairment may be facing difficulty with. Now, here is a person, and uh, her name is August Dieter. Uh, she, was, uh, she was diagnosed by a doctor, um, a German doctor named Alois Alzheimer, right, in 1901. So she was 51 years old. Uh, they were, people were saying that she was living in the past, um, had uh, memory problems, uh, was getting lost spatially, and, um, and he di diagnosed her with, um, well, what we call today as Alzheimer's disease, the first patient. And that was in 1901, so a little over, well, 120 or so years ago. And, uh, and the one thing that they noticed about her um, when they did autopsies is the presence of kind of a very um, messy-looking brain filled with things called plaques that we call today. And we'll get a little bit more into that a little bit later. Uh, but this has been a challenge and been known to medicine for over 120 years. 
and it's probably one of the biggest, most complex mysteries um, of how to handle um, uh, from at least a medical standpoint uh, for, for that whole time. Um, but it's a very exciting time now, and, and, I'll, and I'll let you know about, more about that uh, in the coming slides. Now, from the aging standpoint, our brains are, are about 2 to 3% of our body weight, yet they burn about 25, 30% of our calories. So our brains are extremely energy hungry. They gobble up glucose like you won't believe, right? And they burn it like just like that. There is constant energy usage in the brain. Um, and the, because, it's, because so much energy production and usage takes place, you can almost think of the brain as, as just, um, uh, now, now with the advent of a lot of electric cars, I, an internal combustion engine car. <laughs> so, I can't just say car anymore. <laughs> yeah. uh, an ICE, an internal combustion engine car, right? So a regular car burning lots of fuel, right? Lots of byproducts coming out of that. Lots of intermediate just byproducts just busting out, right? A lot of waste products being generated, right? And they're filling the brain, right? The brain needs, is constantly being, I guess you can say, um, challenged, right? By oxidative stress, as we call it. And those are, uh, that's the result of many of the byproducts that are produced through the generation and usage of energy that the brain needs to function. So oxidative stress is a big, big factor that starts to age the brain because if there's a buildup of these oxidative species, they call them free radicals, which are basically just highly radical little molecules that float around, what happens is that they start to damage things like the membrane of the cell, or they start to damage the cell's ability to reproduce itself, or they damage the cell's ability to create even more energy, and then they're not, not able to create the energy required for it to function, right? So there's a lot of different elements that come into play. And all that starts to cascade down into different aspects, ending with neuroinflammation. And, uh, and inflammation is a huge underlying feature of many chronic diseases, um, including dementias. So I thought the avocado example was really nice because that's a great like, example of a oxidative stress. So, uh, but um, another thing about brain aging is that it happens over time. We're talking decades. So peak brain function and performance is around late 20s. That's like peak. Oh, you could do all sorts of stuff, you know? Um, <clears throat> and it starts to go down <laughs> from there. This is a, a landmark study done by Denise Park, uh, no relation <laughs> to me, uh, over at um, uh, University, of, uh, University of Texas Dallas, I think it was. Uh, and, uh, and she created something called the scaffolding theory of a brain um, cognitive aging. Now basically what they did is they tracked in, you know, okay, what are different domains of cognition, you know, different parts or ways of thinking, and how are they affected over time? And they started charting it out, and you can see in the purple lines there that a lot of our domains, like how fast we can do a task in our brain, or uh, working memory, like um, a good example of working memory is uh, somebody gives you their phone number, like my phone number is such and such. Oh, okay, okay, now you have it in your head, now you're gonna go write it down. That's what it is, got it, you know, so. Or uh, so, so working memory, uh, long-term memory, all those start to fade uh, as we age. The only thing that tended to be stable was something they called world knowledge. I'm not sure exactly what she meant by that. It's, it had to do with vocabulary, things, you know, like basically lo knowing long words. Um, but, um, but that's just one, <laughs> and that's pretty much all. So the brain aging takes place over many years and decades. That's actually, you can look at it either as either a good thing or a bad thing, right? Uh, it's, it's gradual, which is, which is good, but it's also gradual, so it could run under the radar, actually, for a while, so. Okay, so brain aging is joining a group uh, that is, uh, that's not a very pleasant group, right? So. So, the, so, so you ever heard of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, right? It's like it's the end of the world, right? It's the end of the world. Well, this, they, they, they're, uh, they, they, they're here already. Um, uh, they're, they're basically in the form of these four horsemen of disease. And uh, you can look at it, break it down as one being metabolic, which for adults um, in aging typically means uh, diabetes, right? Uh, Cardiovascular, you know, so heart disease, um, cancer, 
And finally, joining them is dementia. And the, uh, the thing is, these four, these four diseases here, disease states, uh, they're, they're going to kill off 80 to 90 percent of the industrialized world, right? That's what they do. Um, they, they are, these guys are the killers. Um, now, to get to the longevity part of things, if we can get a control of these, then now we're, we're, really, we're really digging into that 10 years we want, right? That extra 10 years, maybe even more, you know? But if we don't address the underlying features of these or underlying pathology of these, then chances are, in industrialized countries, we are going to succumb to one of these four. Okay. And uh, so are we scared yet? Yeah. I, I, was, I was really scary. I was like, ooh. I was like, I'm going to use that. <laughs> this is a, one scary picture, you know? Uh, so, so these are the diseases of affluence, if you will, right? So in the United States, you know, Europe, you know, East Asia, right? Like these are, so, so these are chronic diseases. Um, now let's zoom in on our friend, the spiky one, um, dementia. And among the four, it is, it is unique, very unique. Um, there, there are a few reasons why. Uh, and, and one of the first is that, uh, it can run under the radar, so as it, uh, as it starts, states there in the second bullet, it could run under the radar, and you don't know it. That's, that's the key, we don't know it. And um, Ellie will get into a little bit about how we can know it a little bit earlier, but for the longest, longest time, we don't know it. Like for instance, you know if you're gonna start descending into diabetes because you have some really good markers there. You have fasting glucose, and you also have this brilliant marker, this amazing game-changing marker for diabetes, which was A1C, right? Um, and then you can start to avoid it, and you can track your avoidance through that, right? Uh, the next thing is there are no good drugs. Um, even cancer drugs actually are getting pretty darn good um, in some of the major cancers. Um, obviously for cardiovascular, wonderful drugs that have come out, but when it comes to, to Alzheimer's and dementias, Really, really nothing. We'll get into some of the new ones that have come out, um, but still minor. Uh, and then, of course, they, they, they have a tremendous toll. So the average, average cost is, is, is in the hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, when, when there is a person afflicted by a type of dementia. And when that happens, a lot of times, that is not going to be covered by reimbursement-based uh, reimbursement health care. Right? You're, you're looking at long-term care, and a lot of people look at it and go, what? what's long-term care? What's that? Oh, here's the bill, you know, for the uh, nursing home or the uh, assisted care facility, you know. So the impact financially, emotionally, um, is is tremendous uh, of these diseases. And all the while, so there, these are rising, while all these other major causes of death over the past 20 years have been either stable or even dropping. So, and that's the reason why it's growing so fast. So it's the um, one third of people over the age of 65 is going to succumb to um, a type of dementia. One third. One third, yeah. So that's also why the NIH, you know, and they went into panic mode, you know, about six years ago. And they started really funding more and more research into Alzheimer's because they realized what was going on, you know. And so um, for a long time, cancer, I believe, took up a, a huge portion of the budget. Um, justifiably, justifiably so. It's a, it's, it's a major disease state, uh, but then, uh, then of course, dementia is getting attention. All right. <laughs> so I'll take a breath. Okay. Ah. <sighs> All right. Let's take ourselves away for a moment. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let's go to the. Let's go to the Mediterranean. Let's do it. So enter the blue zones. Okay. So you might, have, you might have heard of blue zones. Um, I, I know they've been topics in salons, right? So, uh, so they're, they're, um, they're the places where people age successfully. Uh, there are two guys, two researchers. Um, uh, oh, now I'm going to have to go back to my notes. But uh, Michelle Poulain and, 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 and uh, Gianni Pess. OK, so Michelle Poulain and Gianni Pess, uh, two researchers in Italy around the early 2000s. Uh, they were studying the island of Sardinia. And they, and they found out that there's this little pocket, two pockets in Sardinia, I think it's on the, uh, it's on the eastern side and on the northern side. 
people were living really long. And they were looking at all the chronic disease states. Like, wow, you know, chronic disease, super low. You know, there could be something about this. And then they started studying their lifestyles, right? And then a fellow, so I think somebody said it, named Dan Buettner, caught wind of this, right? And then he joined up with them and started looking at other places with similar characteristics of these pockets in Sardinia that were very long-lived, right? And what they did on their maps whenever they looked at places is they circled those places with a blue pen. And they called them the blue zones. <laughs> so, so it's Ikaria, Greece. It's another one, Okinawa, Japan, uh, Nicoya Peninsula in, in, uh, in Costa Rica. And believe it or not, USA, USA. <laughs> The U.S. actually has one, surprisingly, right? So Loma Linda, California. Loma Linda, California. Loma Linda, California, folks, they, they, they live 10 years longer than the average American. Wow. 10 years longer. So mm -hmm. Seventh-day Adventist community in Southern California. Uh, they are vegetarians, but it's not just their diet. They're a whole lifestyle that, that's geared towards longevity. So um, now... When it comes to diets, because that's, I, I shouldn't even say diets, I, say, I should say nutrition is, is, is mostly, mostly my place, but diet starts to go there, right? So the diets in the blue zones are essentially Mediterranean type diets, of course, right? And, or they resemble them or they're equivalent if they're not in that geographic region. Similarities of an overlap are huge. So they're Mediterranean type diets. And um, you might wonder then, how were the Mediterranean diets connected to brain aging? How was that connection made? For the longest time, the Mediterranean type diets were connected to cardiovascular health, right? They were seen as cardioprotective diets for a very long time, um, since almost maybe the 1970s, right? And this happened pretty recently, actually. When it comes to medicine, about a decade ago is like yesterday. Um, medicine moves slow, right? conservatively and carefully, right? So one study was happening, and uh, it was called Predimed, and it was done in Spain. And uh, what they did is, they, and they, they were testing the idea of, remember, now, you might remember, like, in the early 2000s, maybe 1990s and things like that, you know, everybody would say, for heart health, but well, you want to have a low-fat diet, right? That was like the thing. It was almost like kind of a popular, kind of common thing to think. Low-fat diets, right? So when they were testing the hypothesis that it's not necessarily a low-fat diet, actually. We're going to give our, control, our treatment group, the, 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 our control group will get the low-fat diet. Our treatment group, you know what we're going to give them? We're going to give them a lot of fat, or we're going to give them a lot of olive oil. A lot of olive oil, and they made another treatment group, and they gave them a ton of, a ton of walnuts and, and nuts, basically. And, uh, and so they watched, they followed them along. It was about 7,500 patients or a, a subjects in their study. Uh, and originally, PrediMed was actually designed for cardioprotective, um, cardioprotective uh, uh, outcomes, right? They, they siphoned off about 2,500 of those 7,500 for a cognitive study, right? They said, Let, let's look at the brain, too. Let's just check it out and see what happens with them. We'll do some testing, you know, things like that. And they realized after they had finished, uh, the study, I think, ran from 20, 2003 to 2009, about five years long pulled people out, did the studies, and all of a sudden, whoa, there's a major signal um, in, uh, in memory. And then overall cognition, they created like a composite score of all the different ways people think. And they said, OK, wow, significance there. You know? Meanwhile, over in Chicago at Rush University Medical Center, this other group is thinking kind of like the same thing. right? They're thinking, well, there's cardioprotective diets or, um, out there, like the Mediterranean. But also over here in the United States, you know, we had created something called the DASH diet, right? It's the, it the dietary approaches to stop hypertension diet, right? So it was a hypertension-focused diet. And they said, you know what? There are lots of elements. I can, maybe if we mash them together, <laughs> mash them together, take out some of the most brain or, or accentuate some of the most brain-relevant uh, foods, maybe we can create a diet called the MIND diet. And let's, let's take a look at how it performs in about 1,000 people over about 5.5 five years-ish also. And what happens is that they realize that, oh, wow, you know, the reduce of Alzheimer's is, is, is dropped by about 50, 53%, right? So that's just like, if you can reduce anything risk by, you know, 50%, that's a, that's a huge number, huge number. And then 
On top of that, from a cognitive performance standpoint, so when they did this, ba this battery of cognitive tests, you know, they realized they're performing eight years younger than their peers. So basically, you know, wow, you know, I would love to have, you know, my, the cognitive ability of a person 10 years younger than me, right, you know? So, or about that. So those were huge seminal works that came out and everything else has just been piling on since then. And of course, they, 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 were, they were feeding off, off previous knowledge as well. I don't want to say that these folks just did everything all at once, right? But these are the ones that they are basically the unicorns, if you will. You know, if you look at the amount of citations that these papers got, it's just insane. You know, they're, they're, they're the bedrock of what's going on right now in brain health and nutrition. So, all right. So when it comes to Mediterranean diet, all right, you might have heard of this, right? And so you'll know that it is mostly a plant-based diet primarily a plant-based diet. It does have some lean meats in it, but primarily a plant-based diet. We have some fish you know, and some poultry. Big on beans, and, and the fiber aspect that comes out of that is huge. Uh, so you know, when it comes to a lot of people, you know, there's, a, there's a lot of issues, at least in the United States today, with inflammation of the gut. Right? And there's also, correspondingly, a huge, huge defici deficiency in the amount of fiber we intake per day. You know, just, that's just I'm not saying causation here, but you know, it's something to look at, right? So from a fiber standpoint, very high. Um, nuts and then healthy oils. So olive oil being the primary cooking and dressing oil. And then um, other monounsaturated oils like avocado and a lot of liquid. So tea, red wine in modest amounts. And we'll get to why red wine um, in, in a little bit. But um, they stay hydrated. So, and that's important. Now, okay, so we have, some, we have a thought of the Mediterranean diet in general. Now, what I, you know, what, what I wanted to do was walk you through a few of the nutrients, actually, that, that, that we can pull out of the Mediterranean diet that, that are exciting for, for brain health, actually. And it breaks down into six types. And now I know, I know this is 10 slides, <laughs> so I'll try, and move, I'll try and move quick. But, um, but uh, basically, what I want to direct your attention to is here on the left-hand side right there. So, you know, on the left-hand side, those are polyphenols. They're plant-based phytonutrients. Uh, they're different classes. And the thing, the, the, the point I, I wanted to mention here is that these are very potent antioxidants. And as we mentioned before, the brain produces a lot of oxidative stress for itself to function. So they're very, very potent antioxidants and anti-inflammatories. And plants are really, really good at doing that. They're really, they have tremendous systems to stay alive. And I remember, and I, I, for, I forget exactly where I was reading or watching or listening, but it struck me why, and what, because it was told, I mean, it, um, it, it struck me why plants are so good at protecting themselves through antioxidants. And it's because they can't move. <laughs> they can't run. You know, and when, it, when I heard that, I was like, duh, you know, it's like that, of course, that's why. I mean, they're, they, they, they have to deal with the, the weather, the, the pests, the, you know, all the other different the pathogens that are in the soil next to them. You know, they have to deal with all that, and they can't even move. They got to have their own systems to stay alive. And that's why eating plants is so important for us, right? Because they're going to supply us with a lot of these nutrients that the plants have basically, you know, have perfected, you know, to basically stay alive, right? Um, there are also many other nutrients here that we're going to go through. And, and like I said, I'm going to, I'm going to try and move through these pretty quick. So, um, so flavanols, my, my point here, so flavanols are one class. They are the latest to be added to brain nutrients, actually, that are really exciting. Rush University Medical Center, again, uh, mining their data uh, from some of the earlier mind studies and, and forward, right? What they did is they started isolating down nutrients that people were taking in a lot of, and flavanols in about 2020 and also last year in 2023, they released two papers, you know, very neat papers, um, where they showed that certain flavanols, they have funny names, like like camphorol and quercetin and mercetin. You might have heard of quercetin actually, it got a lot of press during COVID. Quercetin is basically, um, it just calms down um, mast cells, right? So it's, a, it's really, you know, it's a really, a lot, people with seasonal allergies, also a lot of times they tend to take some quercetin, you know, instead of maybe some of the um, over-the-counter drugs. Um, Mercin, isohamtin, and fisetin. 
So these, what they do, um, or what, where they're in, um, is, is, is primarily leafy greens and berries, and, and just generally, if you're, if you're looking at colored fruits, fruits you're gonna get some, colored fruits and vegetables, you're gonna get some. And um, in the next few slides are gonna follow this pattern, but basically, you know, I wanted to try and highlight a couple, uh, a few of the different mechanisms that are important for brain health and structure and function that um, they're good at, if you will, right? And, uh, and one thing you might see here is, is the anti-plaque, right? And we'll, we'll, like I said, we'll discuss what anti-plaque means, but remember when I mentioned um, August Dieter, the first patient diagnosed with Alzheimer's, she had a lot of plaques in her brain, right? And for energy production. So stilbonoids are another one. Now stilbonoids, you might recognize one of them, resveratrol, right? Stilbonoids are, are what we call phytoalexins, and what they do is basically, they're what plants have created to be antifungals. They're like, we don't, I'm gonna fight off the fungus. <laughs> so these are essentially antifungals for plants. They do a lot of other things. They help the cells communicate to each other. A lot of times, cells need to talk to each other to even stay alive. If they stop talking to each other, they're gonna die. Um, so cell-cell communication is very important. Um, and once again, you'll consistently see antioxidant and anti-inflammatory. Resveratrol and pterostilbene are very, very similar in structure if you looked at them. Um, they just vary by a couple of these little groups that are hanging off the side. Um, but the thing about pterostilbene is it's the sister of resveratrol except that pterostilbene actually is able to be absorbed actually much better. Resveratrol, the biggest issue there, and I think a lot of people, it came about you know, as people were getting really excited about drinking a lot of wine, and getting the resveratrol, you realize resveratrol, it, it gets metabolized like lightning. Like you, you know, it goes into your bloodstream and all of a sudden, bam, it's gone. It's like, where'd it go? It's like a flash in a pan, it's gone. Uh, so pterostilbene's kind of like, is, is like resveratrol, but lasts a little bit longer. But, and pterostilbene's almost exclusively found in blueberries. So, uh, okay, anthocyanins. Now, going, staying with the berries, okay, staying, sticking with the berries, anthocyanins are the pigments that make the berries colored. They're, they're violets, they're, they're reds, they're pinks. So anthocyanins are pigments, uh, but they're also really, really potent antioxidants and anti-inflammatories. So they come with funny names also like cyanidin, malvidin, pelargonidin, and delphinidin, but they're always gonna be in these berries. Um, pelargonidin is very unique. It's because it's almost solely found in strawberries. Your only dietary source of pelargonidin is going to be strawberries. And of course, what did Rush University do? They said, we're going to focus on pelargonidin. <laughs> and they did a couple, and, and, and they looked at the data there and like, you should eat strawberries, and a lot of them. So, so pelargonidin is a, is, is, a, is a very neat and unique um, anthocyanin. Cy, uh, cyanidin and malvidin are commonly found in, 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 in like blackberries um, and other types of berries. So. And the fourth is catechins, all right? And catechins are almost exclusively found in green tea, not, 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 not black tea, but green tea. Um, also, to some extent, in chocolate. So that should make Jeannie feel good. <laughs> so, uh, and so they, you might have heard of them, some of these like initials, they all have these E's and G's and C's. Uh, the, 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 the catechin that's been most commonly studied uh, and, and has most evidence on the brain side is EGCG. It's the longest one. It also happens to be um, probably the richest, usually about 50% of all catechins in green tea, so that's why I, th I think there's a lot of, a lot of study on it. Um, good for uh, cerebrovascular health also, so blood flow and circulation. Uh, yes? Question, <laughs> would decaffeinated green tea count or does it have to be? Decaffeinated would be fine. Oh yeah, yeah, uh -huh. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Chocolate is it dark and milk chocolate? Oh, I mean, in cho chocolate in general, um, but uh, you'll get more if you if you have dark chocolate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, so catechins, um, and then uh, and then carotenoids. Mm -hmm. So uh, carotenoids uh, as are are like sounds like carrot. So uh, what they are, they're, they're, they're antioxidants, but what they do is that they travel along, they, they travel along the, the, the walls of cells. So the walls of cells are made of are, are fatty, 
And so what they do is they, kind of, they like to attach to that and clean up a lot of that mess, if you will, a lot of the debris and a lot of the, the, the intermediates along cell walls. So they maintain cell wall health, and that's important for neurons um, in particular. And they're also very good for eye health too, so by the way, uh, very good. Now, um, one thing about lutein and say xanthin in particular is that uh, they're the richest carotenoids um, in the brain and in the eyes. Uh, it kind of tells us something. And um, some, although this, isn't a, this is not a, a, a diagnosis method, but a lot of you know, some physicians um, will say, I can look at the pigmentation, because lutein and zeaxanthin are pigments, right? They're gonna be, they're gonna add a little bit of that orange color, right? I can look into people's eyes, see what their, relatively what their concentration is of lutein and zeaxanthin in their macula. I can almost predict whether or not they're gonna have Alzheimer's later, right? So, um, so it's almost like a window into the brain, if you will. So they're very, so, and what they, and because they're strong antioxidants, lutein and zeaxanthin are very rich in the macula because, of course, we're being exposed by light from the sun, right? And there's a lot of oxidative stress associated with that, so. Uh, okay, so we'll go into some of these others. And the B vitamins are important. Uh, they're particularly important. Uh, this, uh, the, the B6, B9, B12 trio, right, are particularly important for clearing out a toxin called homocysteine. Um, it, from, from our bodies. And, and homocysteine, when it builds up, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an amino acid, and if it builds up too much, what happens is it becomes toxic, and it's neurotoxic in particular. Uh, so um, the funny thing is, is that these B6, B9, B12 help it, help it either push itself out into a couple, takes homocysteine and breaks it down into two things. You know, it's, I think methionine and cysteine, right? And those are actually antioxidant and anti-inflammatory, right? So, so you gotta help it clear out and break down. If you're deficient or low in any of these, then, uh, th then you might be holding up that, that particular pipeline, if you will. And so that's, that's a, a note I wanted to make here. Also choline, I included here. I wouldn't be surprised and maybe, actually, yeah, I shouldn't make any predictions, but it may never happen. But a lot of times, um, uh, nutrition, uh, in general, thinks of choline as a B vitamin because of its structure. It's very similar. Uh, and choline's very rich in eggs, uh, but um, I included it here as well. Now, choline is a building block. So have you ever heard of acetylcholine? It's a neurotransmitter. All right, so one of the building blocks, right, of acetylcholine is choline itself. You know, and that's why, you know, having um, adequate choline is very important. Uh, and then we have fat-soluble vitamins. So you may have heard an easy way to kind of remember fat soluble vitamins is to think, you know, ADEC, ADEC, you know, A-D-E-K, right? So the ADEC vitamins. And, uh, and I kind of grouped them together here, although they're, they're, they're quite diverse. Uh, but, uh, but a couple of very, um, a couple of notes to make is that uh, vitamin D, um, we, we heard a lot about vitamin D during COVID also, um, but, uh, but for vitamin D, the brain is full of vitamin D receptors, okay? We don't know <laughs> exactly, you know, the, the exact purpose of that, but it's full of those receptors, and there's, there's gotta be a reason for that, right? So from a vitamin D standpoint, um, obviously vitamin D has been, you know, correlated uh, to, uh, to cognitive decline or deficiency in cognitive uh, deficiency in vitamin D intake has been correlated to it. And so you put those two together, you know, there could be a mechanism and, and plausibility there. And then for vitamin E, one thing I want to point out there is that vitamin E is actually eight different, iso, um, eight different isoforms, so eight, eight different forms. Uh, there's, so, so there's eight different forms of vitamin E, and the one that gets all the attention and that you see probably in, in a lot of um, you know, nutritional products, is what we call alpha tocopherol. Okay. Now, some people, because vitamin E is a nice, strong antioxidant, right? Um, some people will say, okay, I'm gonna have a lot of vitamin E if I'm a little low in it, right? And they'll take vitamin E, right? But they're only gonna get that one form. And the thing about that is that it, it's, it's a, it was a very surprising, but in a few studies in the early 2000s, what happened is that they realized that if you over supplement with vitamin E, which is just that one form, your all cause mortality goes up. Okay? All right, so vitamin E is a very interesting fat soluble vitamin because um, 
the different forms have to come in certain ratios. If you box out all the others by just supplementing the most common alpha tocopherol version, then you could be doing more harm than good. So that's just the, the message there. But overall, these are particularly important for brain health. And, um, and then the next will be fatty acids. I, you know, I was debating whether or not to put like a big old salmon on here, or maybe like a, I, was, I actually Googled this like to see whether or not it's like salmon and olive oil image, like, on a, like a salmon being jumping into all of whatever. You know, I couldn't get, bring them all together. Um, but fatty acids are important. But my, my message here is, is, is that when you think about fatty acids and what type to have, it's unsaturated fatty acids, right? not saturated fatty acids. So, and, and, and the easy way to see is that at room temperature, or if you cool it off just a little bit more, a saturated fatty acid will start to solidify. Um, whereas an unsaturated one won't. You know, like olive oil, it'll just sit there. I mean, you could take it down pretty down temperature, it'll just sit there as a liquid. And that's probably why the cold water fish have it in them, or else they'd basically not be able to move so, <laughs> in the water. Uh, so, so these, these uh, unsaturated fatty acids are very important. Some are monounsaturated, like oleic acid, which is what you get in olive oil. Some are polyunsaturated, like DHA and EPA, and you've heard of those, those are omega-3 fatty acids. And then ALA, which is also another omega-3. The EPA and DHA come from fish primarily, right? And then the alpha linoleic comes primarily from walnuts, right? Or pin pecans, too. Uh, so, uh, so they also have many different effects on brain structure and function. And in particular, the structure part is important because DHA and EPA integrate themselves into our, the neuron brain walls, or sorry, the, the cell walls of neurons. So they are structural as well. Uh, but they're also anti-inflammatory, too, because then they break down. And what they break down into is something called resolvins, which are basically the things that resolve. I know, scientists are so, uh, we're, we're, we're so, scientists are so original. You know, they're like, oh, that resolves inflammation. Let's call it a resolvin. So, so, so DHA and EPA also are precursors and are in the cascade that eventually results in resolvins later on also. So they're structural and they're functional. Very, very important for the brain. Um, um, and uh, okay, we're almost here to the end here. So amino acids, right? So theanine. Theanine comes in green tea. And I think, uh, Nina, you had mentioned, you had asked about you know, the caffeine, right? So yeah, theanine, theanine actually, for some reason, green tea was per perfectly like formulated as a plant. And you know, the theanine is what kind of calms down and cancels uh, the effect of caffeine. Uh, and, uh, and then there's creatine. So I know that there's, you know, we, we might not think of ourselves as bodybuilders, right? Uh, but creatine actually is very important uh, for, for energetics and production of, the, uh, production of energy uh, for the brain. And magnesium and selenium. Selenium is very, very important for the recycling of our universal antioxidant of the body called glutathione. So very important for that. And magnesium, and that's also for uh, flux balance. Um, in, in, in neurons also, because neurons are basically, they're, they're basically electrical, they're, they're sending charges back and forth and need to balance that, so. Um, and then I'm just gonna move really quickly, there's some mushrooms. So mushrooms, uh, kind of like the newest addition, I'm not exactly sure how much they're consumed in the Mediterranean diet actually, but I felt I had to add mushrooms <laughs> to this. So I'm adding them here, and what we're learning is that certain mushrooms like shiitake, oyster, uh, oyster and also lion's mane, they're very rich in, in, in a substance called ergothionine. And, and it turns out, once again, kind of like I mentioned for vitamin D, our bodies have a lot of receptors for ergothionine. We don't know exactly why, right? But, but they're there, which means it might be in need, right? And, and in, in animal studies, ergothionine, what it does is it helps with the creation of new brain cells in addition to the maturation of those brain cells. So there's something about brain growth um, neuron growth there associated with it. Also, they, 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 you know, they're hypothesizing also that heresinones and uh, aranacines, right? So these also coming pre preliminary from, uh, primarily from all lion's mane also might be involved in that process. So, so this whole neurogenesis, and I think we have a nice little, here's a little symbol for that, they're like growing there. So neuronal growth. Uh, mushrooms could be very important for that 
in addition to being very important for other things like fiber and protein. You know, so mushrooms are healthy in general. So, okay, so the power behind the blue zones and the Mediterranean lifestyle and diet is this seesaw. Right? We are constantly trying to battle chronic inflammation, which is the unifying force between the four, amongst all four horsemen, right? We're trying to balance that out and put out that fire there. That's, that's basically my, yeah, my, some, some, some nice little uh, diagrams there. <laughs> so, uh, but I just wanted to emphasize that point there. And what we're faced with on a daily basis is this tension. Because what happens is that, so okay, we kind of know that a Mediterranean-like diet can be helpful not only for the heart, but also for the brain, right? But at the same time, when we walk outside our doors and when we walk through, just drive down the street, you're gonna see restaurants that offer Western diet. You're gonna, you're gonna go to the grocery store and basically almost everything in the grocery store, except for maybe the produce section, right? <laughs> you know, is gonna be pushing towards this. Everything at eye level, you know, is gonna be like Western and standard, standard American diet foods. Everything at this level is gonna be standard American diet for kids, right? For eye level, you know, so, so we have a massive tension going on here and it's pulling us in this direction, right? And that's just something, we want, we want to be aware of it, you know. And I think I, I was watching um, one, one of your salons, I, I forget, she, uh, she did a, a talk on just the food system in general. And, and how, uh, I mean, just the amount of money spent to tell us, um, to, to market to us without knowing that we're being marketed to is, is it, you know, it's billions, right? And, and, to not, and we don't even know it. <laughs> you know, we don't even know it. So, so and that's, that's like, those are like the best marketers in the world, right? You don't even know they're there. You know, you just kind of go in that direction, right? And that's kind of like the, the system we're kind of, you know, we're, we're battling here, you know? Um, I'm going to take a couple slides to just discuss to you, you know, from, from how, to, how to handle this, this how, how I, I, I was thinking and how a team of us were thinking about how to do that. And, uh, and I'm... I mean, my, my, I come from pharmaceuticals. I, I was in pharmaceutical R&D for, for about 15 or 16 years. And, uh, but what, when, my, when my, fa my father had um, got, got dementia, he got the Lewy body type of dementia. And then also he had Parkinson's. And, uh, and at the end, as people go near the end in dementia, it, it eventually becomes a mixed dementia. It's, it's, it's a lot of different types mixed together. Um, but uh, but that, that was a... That was a very impactful time uh, of, of my family's life, right? And that always stuck with me, um, always stuck with me. So, so how do we handle this tension? And so there's a, there's a lot of other folks here that on a daily basis who you know, kind of joined up with, right, realized that, they're, they're, like Marwan Sabah, Jeffrey Cummings actually, they, they, they're seeing patients every day, they're telling them do the Mediterranean diet and it's, it's really hard for people to change. Right? And it's because of like, the, the tension that we're dealing with and the pull. So, so we just wanted to find a practical way to help people handle that. Right? It's, it's a practical way to do it. Right? Um, it's not the perfect, but the thing that we can do is let's anchor on the best evidence, step one. Right? So that's Mediterranean in mind. Okay. So from a dietary and nutritional standpoint, that's where you got to anchor. Um, next thing is we know that it has to be a combination because that's what a whole diet is, right? And I mean, a whole diet is a, is a mixture of many different nutrients and they tend to work together in ways that in many, in many cases we don't understand, right? There are synergies and complementary and additive um, effects that are taking place that, that we don't fully understand. So, but it has to be in a combination. Um, we have to take the nutrients that we're most likely from, a, from, a, from a, an efficiency standpoint, you know, we want to be selective about what we put in. We just can't throw everything in in the kitchen sink. It has to be what we're most profoundly deficient in uh, if we're looking at an average North American um, uh, diet, right? And hit as many of those structure function pathways as possible um, and, and, uh, and, and go from there. And so, and so that's, that's um, this is a slide on Relevate. 
you know, what we developed. And you'll recognize some of the nutrients there on the left-hand side. You can't fit everything. Um, and I just want to say one thing. There's no, a, a nutritional product can never replace a good diet. So it's, it's just not going to happen. A regular, a good diet will, is going to, you know, if you had to choose between one or the other, um, you're going to, you got to take the regular good diet, right? So at the end of the day, nutritional products, what they can only do is they can help you close gaps. That's what they can do. Um, but you need, you need the foundation of, of a good diet. So, so we're trying to close the gaps. And those were 17 were the ones that we identified when we're looking at the epidemiological data. Uh, and we're looking at the fifth quintiles of intake versus the first, and we're comparing it against the brain outcomes for each one of these, realize, wow, people on average in the United States are profoundly deficient in those, and we're going to hit as many of those symbols. You know those symbols we saw earlier? <laughs> so I just threw them. So these are the ones that apply, right? So, you know, from the antioxidants and anti-inflammation to structure and membranes to energy to plaques, et cetera, right? This was a way to handle that tension um, and to close those gaps. And looking at it at a long-term view, right? Because the Mediterranean data and the mind data is all five-year data. You know, it's not one month or one day. Uh, so for the long-term. Now this right here is a way to, to handle uh, a, pr a prevention approach, right? Risk reduction re approach, right? But what, what about people who are already in it? who've been diagnosed with Alzheimer's, right? And that's where I kind of wanted to start finishing up here, right? And that is, you might have heard of some Alzheimer's drugs out there, right? And um, there, there's a lot of press on them, and usually what the press will say is that um, either, they'll go one way or the other. They'll say, oh, this is a total, this is a total garbage, or they'll go another way and say, this is, this, is gonna, this, is the, this is the best thing ever, you know? Um, so I just wanted to give you an, a view as to what they are and, and what they can do, you know? Um, and what these new drugs are, you might have heard of lecanemab. It goes by the trade name Lakembi, right? It was developed by ASI and Biogen, and, uh, and also donanemab. That is another molecule. I don't know what their trade name is going to be, but it's developed by Eli Lilly. And what you'll see here is a picture of a neuron, the edge of a neuron, the wall of it. And let's say everything over there is the neuron, the inside of it, and everything over here is the outside of it, right? And what you have here is something like, an, it's called an APP, so it's an amyloid precursor protein, right? And that's common, right? What happens is that it, cuts, it gets cut the wrong way uh, when, uh, it, it, when, when we start to go into Alzheimer's pathology, right? What happens is it gets cut down into something called amyloid beta, okay? And that's kind of not quite proper, not the quite proper cut, right? And so it's floating around, and it's dissolved, just like salt dissolves in water. You know? And what happens is that later on, though, they start to group together, and they call them protofibrils. Right? And that's what lecanemab does. It's an antibody, so it's an immune molecule that attaches to that really strongly, you know, kind of just grabs it. Right? These then, now, what happens if these are not grabbed onto is that they'll grow into fibrils and clump together and eventually create these plaques, and that is what we commonly see, not all the time, but commonly see in people with Alzheimer's disease upon a autopsy. So tons of plaques in the brain. Now, they designed these so that these monoclonal antibodies would attach at different points. Donanemab likes to attach to the plaques. Lecanemab likes to attract, attach upstream at the protofibril stage, right? And what they do is they attach onto it, now they're attached to them, and they've been tagged, right? And then, of course, the immune cells come in and gobble them up, right, or remove, remove them. So, so these are breakthroughs in the sense that they address underlying biology, right? So this is biology right here on the picture, right? And it's addressing biology, right? Previous to that, all other Alzheimer's drugs only address symptoms. You might have heard of Aricept, right, which is called a... I mean, donepazil is its, is its uh, um, molecular name. But all that did was make sure you have more col acetylcholine circulating in your brain. Just let's dump more acetylcholine in the brain. Just keep those neurotransmitters going, right? Um, here is kind of addressing some of the underlying biology. So that's great. The second thing that's great is that it slows progression of the disease. It can do that, right? So people who have been diagnosed, it could slow them down. 
it does not stop it. So let's just say if you're a train moving at 100 miles an hour, maybe now you're going to be moving at 73 miles an hour. Okay? Yeah. So, and then it's for the earliest stages only. So they realize chances are this, this is not going to work if, if you're further along because there are other mechanisms and cascades that are just like really accelerating the process. It's too late. So, and then there's also some brain bleeding risks, especially within the first few months of taking it. Um, and people who are on antithrombotics, like Elikis or uh, you know, Coumadin, things like that, very, be very, very careful because you know, it killed some people in the study, right? So another thing about it is it will be expensive. Um, Medicare Part B is gonna, I believe it's gonna start covering it, but the thing is, is they ran, they ran a little a financial thing, analysis, I guess, and they realized that even if 3% of people with Alzheimer's over the age of 65 on Medicare Part B took this drug, it would be, they, they'd be spending over $10 billion a year on it. The budget, the budget for drugs for Medicare Part B, and that's the, that's the, that's the drug benefit for, for Medicare, right, is about $40 billion a year. It would be the biggest piece ever of that. So we have a problem right here. Um, so, so there's pluses and there's minuses with these, right? And I just wanted to bring this up because I know there's been a lot of press on it, so I just thought I'd bring it up, so. Yes? Um, can they measure um, that, that progression? Like amyloid B, what you oh, yeah. happens to it? Yeah, they can. Mm -hmm. How do they do that? They do it, uh, they do it, do it through a PET scan, a brain scan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so, th so they can, and that's what they did during the clinical studies to, to, um, uh, to test it. So, mm -hmm. so you can actually label it in the brain, and then they'll put your brain in a scan. So, so it's a, it's a tough process to be on this. It's an infusion drug. So they're they're two, two, every two weeks you got to go into a place that's infused into your, and then on top of that you got to watch out for the brain ble brain bleeding. So what they do is you have to do MRIs, and keep checking. Right, at least a couple times, I think, along the course, so. All right, so last two slides. The future, though, okay? So the future is that there are major prevention studies taking place right now. And what they're doing is they're combining different, what they call modalities, or multimodal studies, in the sense that they're combining cognitive training with exercise, with dietary and nutritional interventions, right? There's big studies going on right now, actually. So in, in the future, within the next few years, maybe five and 10 years, right, we're gonna see a whole bunch of those come through. You know? And they're gonna be proving out very solidly and, and probably very specifically how we can protect ourselves from a, a neuroprotection standpoint. Right? Uh, and then from the drug standpoint, one thing about the amyloid, like attacking amyloid, is that we spent a lot of money on it and a lot of time. 30 years of just looking at that one thing. And f after failure after failure, about 30 years, finally we got something. But the thing is, looking back on it, a lot of researchers and scientists are telling themselves, sheesh, we should have looked at a lot of other causes and a lot of other pathologies in Alzheimer's. And that's, this diagram is too small to read, but it's meant to illustrate there's a lot of different factors that come into play and there's a lot of different ways in which they could attack it. And at the end of the day, one day, if a person is diagnosed and they're already in disease, and and, and they, you know, and, and and this wasn't enough, right? And now they're in disease. And it's going to be a cocktail of drugs one day. It's not just going to be one because there's so many different places where brain um, the brain can be damaged. Um, and then the most important thing uh, from the standpoint of diagnostics is not diagnostics is that you can't do any of this without being able to measure what's going on and really see it early enough so you can make the changes and kind of jolt ourselves into, you know, into action. And so on one side is biomarkers. And remember when I mentioned A1C to you, right? That's a, that was, a, that was, a, uh, that was a, a huge groundbreaking biomarker to, to really help us you know, address uh, diabetes. Uh, here, they're looking, researchers are looking at a lot of blood biomarkers and they're much easier to get at, right? Rather than uh, putting a person and, and puncturing their, their, you know, their, their spine and then grabbing cerebral spinal fluid out of it, you know, and things like that. 
These are much um, better. They could be predictive, and they could also perhaps even monitor our prevention strategies. You know? And then finally, cognitive screening. And I, I put the neuro track here because I know that Ellie's going to be speaking with you about that in a moment. So um, this becomes a regular thing, just like walking in and getting your blood pressure taken on a cuff, right? And getting your weight taken. This, is, this will be a re you know, regular thing. So I'll end with create your own blue zone. And there's a lot of different ways you can do it. You know, from the dietary standpoint, Mediterranean nutrition, follow the 80% 80 80 rules basically. Think of yourselves as if you're 80% full, okay, I'm done, right? That's really hard for me. But like 80% rule, um, you know, it's wonderful to watch things grow, you know. Um, just, just, I know we've been isolated for a long time. Everybody's, it's great that everybody's back together again, you know, for the past year or so, but just reaching out to family and just kind of maintaining relationships. And, and just, if you can just block out a little bit of time <laughs> just to de-stress or just to turn off, um, that's extremely important. Um, and then making, making uh, exercise or activity more natural, mm -hmm. you know? That, 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 that might help in the long run much more because it's a lot harder for us to mobilize ourselves to like, okay, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna sign up for that place, I'm gonna go there on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I'm gonna, you know, it's just, if we can build in natural things, you know, and, you know, um, one, one, thing, one thing I'm doing with my son is I'm practicing hockey with him, you know, dry land conditioning in the backyard. I mean, the sprints and back and forth, it, it wrecks me. It just wrecks me, so. Um, but uh, uh, one thing, uh, yeah, uh, Jeannie wanted me to mention here, if you wanna learn more about Relevate, just go to this website, okay? And, and if you wanna give it a try, then this is, a, this is just for you. It means you're present, you're, like you're here, okay? Very special. All right, so just go there, and it's easy to remember if you want to try it. Okay. All right, Ed, so Ed's slides will be up on my website today. I'll put them up so you can okay. access this as well. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. Now Ellie's going to speak with you. And then, Here we go. And then at the end, they'll they'll both be up for Q and A. Thank you, Ed. That was great. I, I thought I knew a lot about brain health, and and I learned a lot more, uh, lots of other things that I didn't know. Um, I'm, I'm gonna just do a very brief uh, chat just to tell you a little bit about uh, the company that I started and the role of cognitive testing. Um, and I just wanna thank Jeannie so much for having me. Uh, just to introduce myself, I'm Ellie Kaplan and I am the CEO and one of the founders of a company called Neurotrack. We are based here in the Bay, excuse me, in the Bay Area. And um, you know, as many of you here, uh, I too had uh, a personal touch with or experience with Alzheimer's disease. Um, and uh, it was many years ago, uh, but I'm now going through it again with my mom. And so it keeps me motivated to continue to do the work that we're doing at NeuroTrack. We, uh, we're a startup and we are um, a digital health company that is really working to make it possible for people to uh, get access to information about their brain health. Um, and uh, you know, what, what I realized, as many of you may have as well, when I went through the process of uh, helping to care for grandparents on both sides of my family was just how difficult it was to get any kind of insight into memory, attention, executive function, the markers of, uh, of cognitive decline and ultimately of Alzheimer's disease. Um, so I set out to try to change that and started a company called NeuroTrack, which um, it has developed cognitive testing tools that uh, live now in the primary care setting, such that when somebody starting uh, at the age of 65, and 65 is that the number only because that's when Medicare starts to pay for it, you can get a quick and easy screen uh, so that you get a, an understanding of what is going on with your cognitive health. Um, and as Ed mentioned, I mean, it is seeing that 195% increase in uh, the rate of Alzheimer's disease uh, is, you know, just was, I had not seen that, that number before, but it is mind blowing. Uh, but Alzheimer's really, as he mentioned, 
remains the holy grail of medicine in terms of solving it. It is a disease that has historically not had a lot of um, research dollars go into it, um, and we just have not seen the level of progress that, uh, that so many other diseases have, cancer, cardiovascular disease. Um, and you know, when you look at the levels of prevalence, it's unbelievable. Uh, you know, the number of people today who, over the age of 65, who have Alzheimer's is nearly 11%. The number of people with cognitive decline, MCI, uh, that is the precursor often to Alzheimer's disease, is about 22%. So that's a, just a, a, an enormous um, number. And what, what we have realized, and there was a study that came out from USC uh, the, just in the last couple of months, um, looking at how often people are being screened, uh, whether there is any kind of diagnosis at scale, um, it was remarkable uh, what a, um, a lack of diagnosis exists today uh, in the U.S., but really globally. 99% uh, of primary care doctors are not diagnosing it. Um, they're, they are not having conversations about cognitive health. Um, and most people with mild cognitive impairment in the U.S. today and globally are undiagnosed. So this is, you know, we see it as a huge opportunity to make a change, but it's also a, a massive problem. We have lots and lots of people who are walking out with any kind of diagnosis. And when you think about um, the role of prevention today, and, you know, that really is the big thing that you can do. Um, it's, a, it's a massively missed opportunity and one that I'm so glad that Ed and others are focused on in terms of trying to change it. You know, we spoke a little bit about, or Ed spoke a little bit about, about the, the cost of some of these um, drugs that are coming on the market. Uh, and um, they're okay drugs. They're not game-changing drugs. But if we just started diagnosing people earlier, uh, and we got them uh, a bit more educated on what you can do around the role of prevention, it would mean a, a tremendous savings to our overall uh, system in terms of diagnosis. Um, these are more sort of medically oriented uh, slides, but if we look at just kind of the cost of the disease um, to our healthcare system, uh, it's massive. Um, we know that it is also a disease multiplier for any other condition or disease that anyone has. It's a disease multiplier for people with diabetes, for, for people with cancer, for people with uh, cardiovascular disease. And so these are some of the things that we are really trying to, to help solve. In addition to giving people just access to information about their brain. So the solution that we have developed at NeuroTrack, uh, which is really, um, uh, in a, you know, I'm quite biased, but uh, it's in a class of its own when it comes to making it possible for primary care providers to, um, to start utilizing a quick and easy tool to, uh, to help people understand what's going on with their cognition. And so it starts with a three-minute screening test. That three-minute screening test can be delivered either at home or in the clinical setting. Uh, that gives um, both the patient and the provider a very quick thumbs up, thumbs down on uh, overall cognition. Um, if somebody gets flagged by our cognitive screening test, uh, then they um, will get automatically served up additional tests that give more insight into other aspects of cognition. So, um, uh, you know, cognitive domains like attention, executive function, brain processing speed. Uh, and uh, we deliver that all uh, very um, seamlessly into the electronic medical record system uh, such that um, the doctor is served up uh, exactly what they need to know when they come into the room because that testing takes place with the, the MA or the medical assistant. We, uh, we then um, help the doctor work with the patient um, to understand or to define what happens next. So, um, in most cases, that patient will get referred on to neurology. We also on, onboard them into our uh, care management system, uh, which serves up lots of information along the lines of what Ed talked about, uh, what you can do for your brain through diet and exercise, social engagement. Um, we should add, uh, add a slide on your um, 
on uh, Relevate uh, so that, that people can uh, find out more about the, um, the supplement. But the goal here is really to start helping um, people understand what their risk is for cognitive decline um, because we know that's not happening. Um, it's now a requirement of Medicare, so CMS in anticipation of uh, many of these drugs, but also just with the recognition that, um, that, uh, that we were underdiagnosing and not um, capturing people who have the disease, put in place new regulations that say that every, every doctor needs to start testing patients at the age of 65 uh, and up, and, um, and, and to turn it into a vital sign for uh, your overall health. So that's what we're doing at NeuroTrack. We work with primary care doctors, but we work with lots of others. Um, and uh, I would be happy to, if people are interested in, in getting tested, um, I brought some little bookmarks, which I forgot to give you to start with, but um, we'll pass them around so that you have access to our website, and we'd be happy to, to send some, some links around to, uh, to give people access to the test, if that would be of interest. Um, I think that's it. Question about the cognitive test. Can yeah. You calibrate it for age. So yeah. Like, okay, so I can put in my age yep. and say, hey, like, yeah. where should I be at? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So um, there's this thing called norming when you do cognitive testing. So we norm for um, uh, all ages starting at uh, about 20, um, going up to 100. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And if not for Medicare mandating 65, what age would you say is a good age? I mean, we know that, that um, changes start to occur in the brain in your early 30s. Uh, you know, if my dream is that people would start testing uh, around that age and setting your baseline score and then monitoring over time, um, I think we are many years away from, from the health system starting to think about how you test earlier. But, um, Yeah, um, my question was in regards to vitamin D levels. Um, they are all over the place what is recommended. Where, where would you put the number for vitamin D when it's measured? You know, I, I have a feeling that the, uh, US, the RDA is going to change on that within the next, uh, well, I'll say within the next 10 years. I think the, the RDA right now uh, for uh, vitamin D intake is about, they, they do it in IUs, they call them international units. Sometimes they do it in micrograms, but most of the time they do it in what they call IUs, right? And I think the RDA right now is, uh, is like 600 to 700, depending on if you're male or female. Um, uh, you know, that you, you don't, if, if you get above 4,000 on, on a consistent basis, um, because it's a fat soluble vitamin, it might start to accumulate, which is not, not a good thing, but there's a big range there in between, right? 600 to 4,000, you know? So, uh, I mean, you know, when it comes, I mean, just for like, let's say relevant, you know, we, we locked in at about 1,200 IUs, double the USRDA. Um, you know, well within safety, uh, but closer to what the intake is of, of people who have better outcomes. So, yeah. <laughs> and in regards to the salmon, does it have to be fresh cooked or could it be also smoked? Oh, wow. Okay, this is culinary now. <laughs> culinary chemistry, huh? Oh, shoot. Uh, so, um, slow cooked or, or what did you say? Slow cooked? Like smoked. smoked. Smoked? Smoked, like lox. Like it's still salmon because I don't like fresh salmon. It's the salmon. same. <laughs> yeah, it's, I, it's the, I mean, you're still getting the fatty acids, right. the DHA and the EPA. Right. Now, if it's smoked, right, there might be some other elements that might not be as healthy, you know, coming along with it. Uh, but from an, from an omega-3 standpoint, okay. you're, you're probably equivalent, it I'd say, yeah. It depends so. if it's cold smelt or if it's hot smelt. I don't better. think the process removes cold. the... Cold smelt. Cold better. smelt, okay, would be better. There, it's not as smoky. Uh-huh. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, can do. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Better than enough. <laughs> yes. So, hi, I have a quick question about um, the supplement. So, a couple of years ago, um, I went to one of these, and we talked a lot about turmeric being a big anti -inflammatory. Yeah. And everyone ended up like taking turmeric. You didn't even mention turmeric. I know, I know. Yeah, I, you know, I had this, I had this, um, 
I got to 10 slides and I was like, so there are two other slides I was thinking about putting on. One was like just on botanicals, right? Um, and that's like, there are, there's like, you know, uh, uh, there's, there's a Cooper's DNA, um, which is like a natural donepazil, you know, and there's, you know, some of those are mostly used in like traditional and ancient medicine, actually. They're medicines in the ancient, right? And then there's turmeric, which is actually dietary in a lot of cases, right? You know, and turmeric was the other one I went, because it's, it's, it's highly inflammatory, I'm highly anti-inflammatory, right? Yeah, and so, um, but then I thought, okay, well, we're gonna focus on primarily Mediterranean, you know, um, uh, brain healthy nutrients, and of course, turmeric's a little bit more associated with South Asian, right? So, you know, the turmeric is, is right, right there. The cur curcumin is the active molecule, right, within turmeric, so curcumin's about, like, you take turmeric, right, and about 4% of turmeric is curcumin, right, and that's, and that's what, um, that, that's, that's, the, that's the active anti-inflammatory, yeah, yeah. Yes, Jeannie. What's the earliest age that you would start a patient, perhaps, or a family member on Relevate? Uh, like, should I, my 21-year-old be taking it? <laughs> she could, she could, yeah. But like Ellie was saying, it's like, when it comes to just changing people's mindsets and changing the whole mindset of the, the, the medical field and things like that, you know, I mean, I think most people, uh, you know, definitely when you're 40, you know, like 40 and up, right? That's when aging, you know, I mean, you know, starts to, starts to kick in a little bit, you know? So we start to at least feel it. We start to feel it, you know? So, so in the 40s would be, you know, yeah, but hey, hey, ju jump in on it, Jamie. Something to look forward to yeah. when you're 40. Yeah, get that Mediterranean <laughs> diet, get, the, get that Mediterranean nutrition. So, yes, Sally? Well, so first of all, excellent presentation for both of you. Um, my question is for Ed. I'm curious, I know we were talking mostly about diet and brain health, but do you have a perspective on sleep and mm -hmm. how much sleep is needed? There was a new meta-analysis that came out that I kind of have an, a, you know, a, a visceral reaction to, say, showing that a lack of sleep, let's say less than six hours of sleep a night, did not reduce brain volume. Um, but that kind of flies in the face of the other evidence that we have around the, the need for seven to nine hours of sleep a night. And I'm just curious if you have a perspective on it. Yeah, my perspective is I, with like an 11 year old and a seven year old and a two year old, <laughs> coaching his hockey team, I've never played hockey in my life. You know, this, uh, I'd say sleep's so important. <laughs> but I mean, uh, yeah, from a, from a mechanism, like biological standpoint, you know, sleep is sleep is important for brain health from the standpoint of reducing, uh, of removing uh, waste products. So that's when um, it's uh, either lymphatic system, yeah. symptom, yeah, lymphatic system starts to clear out, yeah, a, lo a lot of junk, including amyloid, right? I, so I amyloid's call it going the out. Lymphatic so. system, a garbage truck, but it only does pick up at night. Like, so, that's right. It's weird. It's weird like that. Yeah, they call that uh, autophagy, right? Yeah. So yeah. so it's uh, that's what's happening um, at night. Um, cortisol also, right? Um, usually people aren't sleeping much because uh, they're not managing their circadian rhythm and that cortisol level stays high and of course more exposure to cortisol is gonna run down, you know, your, I mean, it's, it's just gonna run down your whole body. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a stress hormone, you know? Uh, so um, so uh, what, I'm, what I'm trying to do more of is like when I wake up in the morning, so I wear glasses, right? These are blue light blocking, okay? That's kind of like a, <laughs> we're going to get to the ra radiation thing, sunlight thing. Okay, so, so I wake up, I wake up in the morning, and I try to not use my glasses, right, and just kind of stare, kind of in the direction of the sun. What that does is it immediately kind of resets your whole, like uh, sleeping well at night. Uh, and this now I'm just telling you what I've read. Sleeping well at night, or I'm, I'm waking up well in the morning and and staring out at the sun and getting those photons in, right? It it sets you up for a good sleep at night. So the good sleep at night is actually dictated by how you wake up in the morning, right? And that resets your, your cortisol and your melatonin cycles, right? So, so anyway. And a quick question for Ellie. <clears throat> so your product is being used in clinical settings. Is it, being, is it validated for use in research settings yet? Yeah, we started in research. Okay. So we, yeah, so we've done many 30-something clinical trials. Um, Ellie, I have a question for you. One of your slides said two-thirds of people with Alzheimer's are women. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And do you know why that is? Why is the majority of women? Is it hormonal? Or? Um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a lot of different things. And um, 
but one is the hormonal changes that take place, particularly during menopause. Um, so that is a big driver. The other uh, reason that many believe that more women are impacted is because many women are caregivers. And uh, the stress that falls onto a caregiver um, is tremendous. And so it's the, it's the stress, but it's also what often happens when you're caregiving, um, which is that you stop kind of taking care of yourself. It's not just that there's stress, but you stop exercising, you may not be sleeping well. So it's the combination uh, of both of those things. It also disproportionately impacts um, black Americans and Hispanic Americans. Uh, and there it's, um, uh, it is uh, often attributed to what they call SUH, um, which are social determinants of health. Uh, lack of access to good health care. Uh, I was on Monday and Tuesday in Washington for an uh, Alzheimer's Association meeting, and um, there was a, a gentleman who spoke who showed the connection, the correlation between education and Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. uh, lower levels of education have disproportionately higher levels of, of Alzheimer's disease. So. I'm Maya. I'm a local physician, actually, for the village yeah. doctor just down the way um, in primary care. Um, and I'm wondering how your test compares to the mini mental status exam. It's obviously much shorter than the MOCA, but just curious about, like, in terms of, like, accuracy, specificity, yeah. something. Yep. Well, um, I'd be happy to send you some follow-up materials. Yeah, and we'd great. love to uh, talk about um, uh, using our, our test in the clinic. Um, so when you talk about accuracy in diagnostics, you talk about specificity and sensitivity. And so uh, we have higher specificity, specificity and sensitivity than the MINICOG, the MMSC, the MOCA, and a test called the SLUMS. Um, so uh, we have spent many, many years working on that and uh, outperforms all of them. Yeah, I have a question about, I guess it could be either of you, about dairy. I noticed that throughout all of the, you know, the different slides you have, dairy showed up in one. I think it was the amino acids and minerals. But there's dairy and there's dairy. There's, there's non-fat Greek yogurt and there's yeah. full fat, whole milk. Is there, can you be a little more specific yeah. about what types of dairy are most beneficial? Okay, um, yeah, so, yeah, so the dairy, um, Dairy is complicated nowadays is because we're realizing like there's two ways people can uh, can be negatively impacted, right? One is if they're lactose intolerant, right? Mm -hmm. So and then the other is if they're actually allergic to any of the proteins in dairy, right? Yeah. Um, like uh, the like caseins or, or whatever it might be. Um, so uh, so dairy is a, a kind of a, a touchy area. I don't know where the science is ultimately going to land on saturated fats. Mm -hmm. I don't know. You know, it's it's all over the board, right? Um, likely that in the American diet, we take too much anyway. Whether or not there is a good level to be at, um, uh, we, might, we, probably, we might have surpassed it by far anyway. And we were way low on unsaturated, right? There was a question here. <laughs> Patient. Oh. Thank you both for the talk. I had a question for you, Ellie. Twofold. One is, I love the idea that it's mandated that people have a test, because I find that Often when you talk to friends, you want a parent to have testing for MCI, but they are afraid of the ramifications yeah. because they're staying functional. So I kind of wonder if we don't mandate it, if we will get buy-in from those who need it most and wonder your thoughts on that. And I wondered if you've tested in populations that get more Alzheimer's, like my understanding is patients with Downs have a much mm -hmm. higher risk, mm -hmm. and so and younger. So would those get screened earlier, or have you looked at that population? Yeah, just to answer that one first, there is a high correlation between people with Down syndrome and Alzheimer's disease. Um, we have never done any work uh, with Down syndrome, um, not not intentionally. Just the opportunity never arose, um, but certainly. Uh, could be testing in them, and, and uh, I think it would be important. Um, uh, the sec your first question around mandating, um, yes, that was exactly uh, why they mandated it. It's because you know there shouldn't be any ramifications, right? I mean, your your um, your score is protected by HIPAA in your chart, and there aren't 
um, there aren't, you know, concerns, there shouldn't be concerns that it then gets leaked but driving or... driving is the one where people have wanted right. to not get tested. That's right. And those are precisely the people that should be tested. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, you, you know, um, we'd love to also be at the DMV, um, but, uh, you know, I think we're many years away from something like that. I don't know if that yeah. answers your question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Consumer Reports just uh, came out with an article that there's plastic in everything we eat, yeah. pretty much. Is that correlated to Alzheimer's? Has there been any research on it? Because it seems yeah. like it would mess up our brains. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I yeah, I think it'll mess up a lot of things. Yeah, I, I, I know what you're talking about. It was a, it was a research um, where, where they looked at microplastics. So the first thing is that, you know, okay, it can't, it can't be good um, because we're ingesting it and the plastics carry with them um, chemicals, right, that will leach out of them, right, like BPA is the most famous one, right? So that's, a, you know, that, that really disrupts, you know, our endocrine system, right? And then, we ha and then on top of that, the particles themselves, just physically, you know they're gonna they're gonna elicit a response from our immune system. They just and so now you just have another piece in the play of chronic inflammation, right? Just another reason for the body to be chronically inflamed, you know, and that's gonna like underlie right, pretty much all the the horsemen, right? That we that we looked at. So it's I think it's 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 a big underlying problem, you know. We have these vortexes the size of Texas out in the Pacific Ocean that are just loaded with plastics. We get plastics because the currents sweep them up into a nice little spot there, you know, and there's at least, I think, seven major vortexes full of plastic. It's out there, yeah. So. Uh, you mentioned red wine in your presentation, and um, one of the things that I learned this year was that resveratrol is only very, very minimally present in a given glass of wine, so you'd have to drink a ton of that yeah. wine yeah. to get the resveratrol to be beneficial, and then obviously the fact, you know, then you think about metabolic risks of taking empty calories and then also the cancer risk that accompanies yeah. uh, alcohol across best breast cancer and yeah. you know, increasing it by multiple fold over and including yeah. other cancers, esophageal, um, you know, intestinal cancers um, as well. So how do you, when you think about recommending red wine, like how do you think about that in the context of some of these other risk factors and also yeah. the, the mm -hmm minimal amount of resveratrol that's actually in red wine. Yeah, yeah, so from, when it comes to wine, so people talk about resveratrol present in wine. Um, there's also, the, you know those anthocyanins that we looked at? Yeah. They're very rich in wine also, red wine. So, so that they're, actually when the USDA does all their studies and things like that, you know, they're actually focusing more on the anthocyanins in wine than the resveratrol. Yeah, Canada changed their guidelines to no safe lower limit. Um, and I know the U.S. is actually decreasing their what's considered a safe limit, but I, it's an interesting trend that, I, that yeah. I'm noticing. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, yeah, you know, I, 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 I could say like you know, it's it's probably safe enough, right, to say, oh, don't have any wine, right, or don't have any alcohol. It's it's pretty safe to say that, yeah. So, mm -hmm. I just want to throw a little bit of fun in there, you know. <laughs> 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 so, but yeah, I mean. As long as we have issues. chocolate, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jeannie. I didn't see in your slides that learning new things like a language, mm -hmm. you know, really getting your brain to work is something that is also feeding into prevention. Is that true or? That is. That is actually, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really important. And uh, it's kind of, I was thinking maybe it kind of blends into everything, you know, when you're doing all those things. But, um, but this, the concept of being at your threshold of learning is, is really important for, 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 for building um, cognitive reserve, as they call it, you know. So, um, so as we, when we're younger and we're like in elementary school, what we're doing is we're learning math for the first time and we don't, like high school calculus, it's like, what? What the, you know, it's like, what, are we, what is this? Like, and you feel dumb the whole way through, right? You're, you're learning how to write, right? Um, maybe in multiple languages. Um, you're always operating at your threshold of learning and, and we need to be doing that throughout life uh, so that we, because it's really easy as adults to just, once we have our professions, once we finish our formal educations, 
to just do what's in the, well within our comfort zone of right. doing cognitively, right? But once you feel you're taking up something and you're learning and you're feeling dumb and you're feeling frustrated, that's actually a good place to be. That's the good. That's, you're at your threshold, right? And that concept of threshold is something that uh, Tom Holland of our Russian University, one of our advisors, talks about a lot. He talks about get to your cognitive threshold when you're you know, living in your life, you know? So, yeah. Good. So cognitive reserve is something I never heard before. Oh. And you can build a reserve like a reserve account. Yes, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a kind of a catch-all term that describes the ability to, to resist um, injury and damage or, you know, of the brain. So. I always feel dumb. So. <laughs> you're, you yeah. you're right up there. Thank you guys so much. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Right. Thank you, Jeannie. This is great.